I'm going to talk about um, life in extreme environments, seem to have been chopped off at the end there, um, and how microbes adapt to extreme environments and how we can use this in astrobiology, both to try and understand the habitability of extraterrestrial environments and also in practical applications as well. So broadly what I want to do is I want to uh, give a brief introduction to our microbial world and try and convince you that we live on a planet that has for most of its history been dominated by microbes and continues to be dominated by microbes even today. Um, this is the sort of education bit to talk about example extremes and adaptations to them, how microbes adapt to extreme environments. And then what I want to do is to talk uh, a bit about our own research. As this is an astrobiology school, I thought it'd be useful just to illustrate what an astrobiologist who happens to be a microbiologist actually does. So I'm going to illustrate some research from the lab uh, about how we can use microorganisms to try and understand extremes on other planets. I'm going to illustrate some field uh, research we've done just showing you how uh, microbiology field research connects with astrobiology. And then I'll also talk about some experiments we did um, on, on space station uh, using microorganisms with respect to thinking about the human exploration and settlement uh, of space, the establishment of a permanent human presence beyond the Earth, which is also very much part of astrobiology. Um, I know there's been already an introduction to the, to the history of astrobiology, and as I'm sure you're aware, astrobiology connects a whole variety of questions that link biology with, with space sciences and planetary sciences in its broadest context. And, and within those questions is also the human future beyond the Earth, as well as this question about whether there is um, life beyond, beyond the Earth. And, and then throughout this talk, I, I will touch upon what all this means for life uh, on the Earth and, and possibly elsewhere, if life exists elsewhere. Um, given we have two hours, by the way, if anyone has questions, feel free to just put up your hand. It doesn't have to be like a formal hour and a half lecture. If you've got questions along the way, it may be easier just to, just to shout out and we can sort of partly turn this into a, into a discussion as well. This is a slide compressing four and a half billion years uh, of the Earth's history into one hour. And I simply want to use this to convince you that most of the history of life on Earth has been dominated by microorganisms. So this is our one hour here, and we've got four and a half billion years. So the crust forms, of course, uh, immediately after uh, accretion. So this is starting when the planet has accreted. Uh, this, of course, is controversial, as, as we know already. But somewhere around 10 minutes, the uh, origin of life uh, may occur. And then we start a little bit later to find the first, uh, fossil evidence of, of life, the first bacteria. This is, uh, I think, wrong, algal cells. But the first sort of bacteria may be in the fossil record uh, at around this time. And then as we move around uh, this clock, we start to get uh, the first sort of multicellular organisms, Ediacaran fauna and later Cambrian fauna, at around sort of 50 minutes or so, or, or there on out. And the point is that up here, uh, humans in their modern form at 59 minutes, 59.9 seconds. So apart from the trivial observation that civilization has not been here for very long in the grand context of the history of life on Earth, the point is that most of our planet has been a microbial world. If you were to get into a time machine and, and, and press the random button and go back to some random time in the history of the Earth, about two thirds of the time in which there has been life on Earth, there were only microbes on the planet. So from a, from a planetary point of view, from, a, from an astronomical point of view, our planet uh, is, is a microbially dominated one and continues to be to this day, despite our own perceptions that are very much shaped by our view of the world, the scale at which we live in, we still live on a planet that is dominated by microbes. About 50, 60% of the biomass of life on this planet is microbial. <laughs> and most of the genetic diversity is locked up in the microbial world. This is just a very simple uh, phylogenetic tree showing some of the major groups of bacteria, archaea, and eukaryotes. And this black box is just animals. And if you construct a phylogenetic tree, this one happens to be built um, based on 16S and 18S sequences. But if you construct a phylogenetic tree at this level of resolution, you will readily see that the difference between a human being and a fish, for example, is so trivial, it's not even possible to resolve it uh, on this phylogenetic tree. Animals are just one line there. And most of the diversity of life on the planet is microbial, not just prokaryotes in terms of 
bacteria in our care, but also these single-celled eukaryotes as well, with plants out here. So multicellular organisms stuck on the right-hand side here. So even today, we live both in terms of biomass, microbial diversity on a microbially dominated planet. Uh, multicellular organisms are interesting, but they're sort of an afterthought. Okay, don't tell that to multicellular biologists. Uh, but that's the reality in terms of biology. Um, something I always like to raise with my undergraduates, so I'll make it here. This has nothing to do with astrobiology. It's a political side point. One of the interesting things about this perception of a microbially dominated planet, is why don't environmentalists care about microbes? You never see environmentalists walking around with t-shirts that say, save the bacterium, or save the bacterial spore. In fact, every environmental campaign I've ever seen has only concerned itself with this little black box, whether it's tigers, whales, elephants, or whatever. So you can see that even our own perception of, uh, of how we preserve the biosphere is dominated by our own experiences up here. In fact, if you care about genetic diversity on the planet and the base of the world's food chains, you should probably also care about uh, conserving and preventing the destruction of, of, uh, of microorganisms in the microbial biosphere. Now, for those people who are not microbiologists, probably you have an image of these things as being rather boring things uh, with very limited shapes. This is just a, um, uh, a collage of microbes just to uh, convince all of you who are not microbiologists that these are stunning things. If you look down a microscope at microorganisms, they're as fascinating and as diverse as tigers and lions and all that good stuff at the multicellular scale. Microbes come in all sorts of shapes and sizes all of which are fashioned by the chemical and physical environment in which these things live in the same way that multicellular organisms are also uh, fashioned by their physical and chemical environments. Some of them maybe to prevent predation, uh, some of them to get access to nutrients, uh, some of them to photosynthesize. But the, the variety of shapes that one sees at the small scale uh, are very, very diverse. So the microbial world is, is morphologically diverse as well as uh, genetically uh, diverse. So what we're interested in doing as astrobiologists, of course microbiologists are interested in everything to do with microbes, but as astrobiologists we're particularly interested in understanding the limits to which these microbes can go in terms of their ability to replicate or grow under extreme physical or chemical stresses. And the reason for that is if we can define the edges of this microbial, this biological zoo, if you like, then we have a basis from which to assess <coughs> other planets as habitable for life, accepting, of course, that we're limiting our assessment of other planets based on what we know of terrestrial biology, but we sort of have no choice in that matter. And the way I like to think about this as uh, the biosphere is sort of like a zoo surrounded by a fence of physical extremes. And here are just some example physical extremes, but there are, there are many more as well. And provided that biology remains within this fence, then the trajectories of evolution it can explore are, are limitless and, and wonderful in their diversity. So strange furry crabs that live near hydrothermal vents, strange ape creatures, uh, flying reptiles, and so on and so forth. The, the diversity of life uh, that can be produced within this boundary uh, is, is very great. But if you go to the edges of the um, of the zoo, you will find that um, they tend to be dominated by microorganisms. And the reason for that, partly one of the reasons for that, is that it's easier to adapt a single cell to extremes than it is a multicellular organism. It's easier to make one cell acid resistant than, say, an acid resistant crocodile, where you have to modify a whole variety of cell types to be able to survive in an extreme environment. So generally, as we go to um, extremes, the extremes of the biosphere, we find them, uh, we find biological diversity to be reduced and organisms tend to be restricted to microbes. Um, <clears throat> not exclusively, but generally that's, that's the case. And so that is the reason why you will find in astrobiology that most of the biologists who are uh, who take part in astrobiology are microbiologists because these people are investigating the limits of uh, this biosphere. And just to reiterate the point, uh, the reason why we're interested in trying to define these limits is so that we can then compare physical and chemical conditions on other planets and see whether they map within the regions of this zoo that we know are capable of sustaining life on the Earth. And that way we can define a place as being habitable or not, with, of course, 
to reiterate again the caveat that we're looking at terrestrial biology. So the sorts of extremes that, that microbiologists look at are, are hot and cold places, salty and dry environments, uh, acid and alkaline environments, and extremes of pressure and radiation. And I don't want to go through all of these in a sort of tedious shopping list of, of descriptions of, of extreme environments, but I do want to go through a few of these to illustrate some general points about uh, adaptations of microbes to extreme environments, how they do this, and what some of the common factors are. And then we'll think about um, some, some lab work to, to illustrate how, the sorts of experiments that we can do in the laboratory uh, to try and understand uh, these extremes. So, for example, hot environments we might look at. And like all uh, areas of science, of course, microbiologists have a whole nomenclature uh, to describe organisms in different environments. It's not very scientifically interesting. These are just definitions, but they're important because they are used in the literature. And so understanding them is important for uh, understanding what people are trying to say. Uh, for example, thermophiles have an optimum growth temperature of between 50 and 80 degrees, and hyperthermophiles, so thermo, heat, uh, philos, love, hyperthermophiles, microbes that love high temperatures, are generally microbes that have an optimum growth temperature at greater than uh, 80 degrees uh, Celsius. Now, the, the first point to make is that these thermophiles, or these, these extremophiles as they're called, these are not just organisms that can tolerate high temperatures. You'll often see in the literature people say things like extremophiles are microbes that, that can grow at high temperatures or can tolerate high temperatures. This is, this is incorrect. These are organisms that need to grow at these extreme environments. They, ha they have adapted to these extremes. If you take a hypothermophile and try and grow it uh, at, at the temperature in this room, it will either not grow or it will die. So, so the biochemistry of these organisms has adapted to these temperatures. And the reason, um, the biochemical reason for this, for this requirement for these extremes is often down to the, um, uh, the modification of enzymes and proteins to operate at high temperatures. For example, uh, l referring back to the previous talk, enzymes whose catalytic efficiencies have, have adapted to high temperatures just simply won't manage to do catalysis at a sufficient rate at lower temperatures. So the biochemical machinery itself has adapted to these high temperatures. Uh, the record holder is uh, Methanopyrus candleri that can, has been shown to reproduce at 122 degrees C Celsius. And the strange um, temperature here is simply because that was the temperature that the, the autoclave-like apparatus the researchers were, uh, were using uh, was operating at. So the temperature may well go above this, above this temperature. And this raises the first fundamental question in astrobiology that I want to raise and I don't have an answer to. Uh, are the limits to life, that zoo that I showed in the previous slide, is this a serendipitous result of terrestrial evolution? And we had this discussion in the previous talk, or is it set by fundamental physical limits? And if you think about it, terrestrial biology is made of, 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 of carbon-based molecules, or at least molecules that predominantly have carbon in them. And the carbon-carbon bond strength is universal. It doesn't matter whether you're on the Earth or on the other side of the galaxy. If you put enough energy into a biochemical system, those bonds will break down. And the game that life is playing is to try and resynthesize or repair proteins at a sufficient rate, given the energy it can extract from the environment, to be able to operate at these high temperatures. And we can imagine that there must be a temperature at which no amount of evolutionary adaptation would allow life to adapt. Uh, if you go up to 450 degrees, for example, which is a temperature that, that organic chemists use to burn organic material off their glassware, that must be too high, at least for a carbon-based biochemistry. If you do the calculations, you come up with a number like something like 150 degrees is round about a temperature where the destruction to carbon-based molecules is probably so great that you can't extract enough free energy from the environment to repair all those molecules. So it's likely, at least in the case of temperature and probably other extremes as well, that we're not looking at an idiosyncrasy of terrestrial evolution, but something that's universal. Yes, um, this limit might vary plus or minus, you know, 5, 10, 15 degrees, depending upon what sort of biology you're looking at. But generally speaking, the upper temperature limit for life at about 150 may well turn out to be a universal boundary. 
And the reason why that question is important is because it bears on this idea of can we use terrestrial biology as a benchmark for assessing the habitability of other planets? Or is our view of life narrow-minded and based on Earth-based life? I will put the hypothesis out there to you that you can argue with or disagree with, that in fact we're not looking at an idiosyncrasy of Darwinian evolution on the Earth, but in fact the limits of terrestrial life uh, broadly reflect universal limits of biology that's at least constructed on complex carbon-based molecules. But I would say that's one of the fundamental questions of astrobiology. It's a very interesting one. So the challenges, of course, of, of like I've intimated already at this high temperature, the breakdown of biomolecules, uh, increased membrane fluidity from that temperature causing the membranes to jiggle around more, which means that your cell membranes become more leaky. And so you have to try and overcome um, these problems to live at these high temperatures. And one of the ways organisms do this is, is to produce thermostable proteins and enzymes. Uh, you can make something thermostable by introducing more covalent bonds or ionic bonds, salt bridges into proteins, and that will make them hold together against the, uh, against the high temperature, which has, a temperature, which has a tendency to break things apart. If you in increase the number of uh, bonds in proteins, you can make them thermostable. And for those of you that want a, a nice everyday example of why this is important and why, in fact, studying extremophiles is useful on an everyday, uh, everyday experience, this is, a, uh, this is your biological washing powder operating at 60 degrees that's doing your washing for you. Biological uh, washing powders contain enzymes that were originally isolated from organisms in volcanic pools. These are thermostable enzymes that can break down dirt in your, in your washing uh, that are, are thermostable because they evolved in volcanic environments. So here's a very prosaic and practical example of why uh, us uh, astrobiology microbiologists are not completely useless people. We can actually do something practical as well. So by studying life in extremes, uh, and there's a great deal of, of, of industrial interest in extracting enzymes that can work at different temperatures and pHs for, um, for industrial uh, processes. Now, there's another interesting implication of this temperature for astrobiology. If you go into the depths of the Earth, the temperature increases because of the geothermal gradient. It gets hotter as you go towards the centre of the Earth. And that increase in temperature uh, is about 10 to 20 degrees per kilometre, depending upon where you are on the Earth. And so you can work out the depth at which the temperature will exceed the likely upper temperature limit for life. And the result is quite surprising. So here is the Earth, a trivial geological image of the Earth that you might take from a secondary school textbook uh, with the solid core, the liquid core, the lithosphere, the mantle there. Now what I'm going to do is remove all the geology and leave the biosphere, everything that we know contains biology. <coughs> so here is the biosphere, and I've increased the thickness of the biosphere by five times in this diagram, because otherwise you can't see it at all. Okay? So if you assume that the upper temperature limit is 150 degrees, um, the biosphere is no more than about 0.1% of the diameter of the planet. So everyone will say to you, and another thing you'll see in the literature is, oh, extremophiles are everywhere. That shows that life can, can colonize all environments on the Earth. Isn't that incredible? Uh, it's not actually that remarkable at all. In fact, it's pretty, life is pretty unimpressive, and it doesn't colonize much of the planet. It's a veneer on the surface, and in fact, I've always thought that instead of calling it the biosphere, we should really be calling it the biofilm, because it's a layer of life that inhabits the planet, uh, gets down to about five kilometers deep, but in fact, it's a very tenuous layer of replicating, evolving organic material on the planet. It's not that impressive on a, on a planetary scale. Um, and even if you were to assume that that limit to life was wrong and that it went much higher, let's say you were to take the upper temperature limit to life to 450 degrees or something crazy like that, all you're going to do is increase the depth of the biosphere to about 0.3 to 0.4 percent of the radius of the planet. So even if you want to take the optimistic assessment that the evolution of life on Earth is, is just uh, uh, an idiosyncrasy of, of Darwinian evolution on the Earth, it's probably the case that uh, on any planet where there's biology, it's going to be a relatively thin film of life on the planetary surface. So extremophiles allow life to colonize a wide variety of environments on the surface of the Earth and just beneath the surface. But 
in, in totality, the, the biosphere is not, uh, is not an expansive layer of life. You don't have to go far uh, deep into the earth before you find that um, uh, it, it is restricted. Um, the other extreme is, is freezing environments that are also of interest. I'm just going to talk about these briefly just because, of course, many of the places that we are interested in as astrobiologists are cold, whether that's Mars or icy moons. Uh, m uh, most of uh, these other planetary environments we, we would classify as polar-like environments. And these are the domain of the psychrophiles, which are generally microorganisms that need to grow less than 15 degrees. Uh, and if you have salt in water, uh, that temperature of liquid can go below zero. The, currently, uh, lo the current lowest limit or conclusive um, evidence for the, for the lowest temperature limit of replicating life is about minus 18 degrees. And it gets very difficult below that temperature to show replication just because cell processes are so slow. It's just technically a difficult thing to do. I had a postdoc who spent two years at STEC growing one microbe and trying to get it growing at minus 15 and we got one paper out of two years because the thing took four or five months to grow before we saw cell division and that's not within the time scale of normal grants. So to be cynical about this, the reason why we don't know much about life at very low temperature is because grant time scales are too short. You can't give PhD students projects on things that grow at minus 18, it just takes too long. But of course this is of great interest to try and understand exactly what is the lower temperature boundary for life. The challenges are membrane damage from ice, uh, decreased membrane fluidity and the availability of liquid water. It may seem a strange thing to point out, 98% of the world's fresh water is in Antarctica but it's mostly frozen. So if you live in an ice sheet as a microbe, there may be lots of water, but it's all in ice. And so you actually end up with a situation where microbes can be um, limited in their ability to get liquid water. And microbes cannot produce enough energy from metabolic processes to melt ice. We know of no microbe that can melt ice. We know microbes that can sit on the surface of ice and absorb solar radiation, and they'll form a pond on the surface so that they can melt ice in directly by by having these dark pigments. But, but a microbe does not produce enough metabolic energy to, to, to melt ice. So it must be in an environment where some geochemical method exists or some solar energy exists to melt ice. So if you're in an ice sheet, deep in an ice sheet, you can be limited in your availability of liquid water. And the way in which microbes um, deal with these cold temperatures is by changing the membrane composition, uh, again, like high temperatures, and sometimes producing uh, antifreeze agents, for example, uh, trahalose and other sugars that prevent ice crystals from forming, can be synthesized by microbes, and, and I should say insects as well, and fish. Antarctic fish produce antifreeze agents uh, that prevent ice crystal um, formation. I want to talk about this, membrane composition, because for me this is an example of, of stunning beauty in the way in which life adapts to an extreme environment using very simple chemical um, processes. So you, um, I don't know how much this was covered yesterday, we saw, we saw uh, some mention of membranes today, so I'll just go through it anyway, but uh, you'll recall that, that membranes are made from these amphiphilic molecules where you've got these head groups here that, that are hydrophilic, they like water because they're charged, this is just an example of a phospholipid that we heard about this morning which is one type of uh, membrane lipid. And then you've got these hydrophobic tails that, that hate water. And so you've got this molecule, uh, one end of which likes water and one end which does not. And if you add this to water, spontaneously the head groups here will want to stick out into the water because they want to be in contact with water. And the tails want to escape the water, so they will tend to point towards each other in this way and thereby exclude water. So the membrane uh, the formation of a membrane is, is a thing of, uh, again, of, of stunning simplicity in the way in which these amphiphilic molecules will self-assemble to form a membrane. Now, if these um, hydrophobic uh, tails are, are saturated and have single bonds, they'll form these long, straight alkane chains that you can see here that will line up with each other nicely in this well-packed configuration that you can see in the, in the left-hand side here. And the problem with this is that if you cool that down, it will solidify. 
And the best way to explain that with, with a sort of household analogy is butter. So butter, for example, has large amounts of saturated fats, long straight chains like these. If you put uh, butter on your kitchen table, it goes soft. If you put it in the fridge, it will go solid quite quickly. And the same thing happens with microbes. If you take them down to Antarctica and you put them in an ice sheet, these long chains will tend to stack up nice and rigidly, and the membrane will go rigid if they've got these saturated fatty acids in there. And the problem is that the membrane goes rigid, and then it's difficult for the microbe to exchange nutrients, to get nutrients in and take waste out. So how does a microbe deal with uh, this problem of, of its membrane essentially freezing up in, in cold conditions, or at least going solid? And one way in which you can deal with this is to introduce an unsaturated uh, double bond into one of these fatty acid chains. And you'll see that the effect of that double bond is to create a kink in, what, in that side chain. You see it kicking out to one side here. Now if you take these membrane lipids and you stack them up, you'll see they don't stack together so well. They're now pushed aside from each other because they've got these chains kinking out to one side. And the analogy here would be something like olive oil that has more unsaturated fatty acids. If you put that on your kitchen table, it's a liquid. If you put it in the fridge, it generally remains fairly liquid. So if you introduce unsaturated fatty acids, you can make this thing less well packed. And as a result, it remains more fluid at low temperatures. And sure enough, if you go to places like Antarctica or cold environments and you look at the membrane composition of microbes, you will find they increase, or many of them will increase, the amount of unsaturated fatty acids to maintain fluidity uh, in the membrane. And the reason why I think this is stunning, I will show my undergraduates this, and, and I still think it's an amazingly uh, beautiful example of microbial adaptation, because all we've done here is introduced a single extra bond between two carbon atoms, and we've now allowed microbes to explore and exploit entire freezing regions of a planet. So this is an example of an alteration at a subatomic scale that has implications for habitability on a planetary scale. And it shows that adaptations of life to conditions on a planet do not necessarily have to require complex evolutionary adaptations. Uh, at their core, some of these adaptations are, are stunningly simple at the, as I say, at the, at the atomic and subatomic level. A simple change can create uh, new molecules that can allow uh, microbes to, to, to move into new environments. I should say it's not quite that simple, of course, because microbes have other adaptations as well, like the antifreeze compounds. But you get the general point that this is a chemically simple adaptation with huge implications for, for adaptation. And I think it speaks to something general about adaptations of biology. Once you have replicating, uh, evolving matter on the surface of a planet, um, it doesn't take much in terms of chemistry and biology to get that matter to evolve to be able to uh, move into different environments. And I suspect if there is life elsewhere, one would find the same sort of principle, simple chemical and physical adaptations in molecules, whatever they might be, allowing life to, to move out into new environments. And the evolutionary aspects of this are easy to understand, right? The first microbe that happened to uh, introduce an error of a double bond into its fatty acid uh, was able to be washed into a colder environment and probably did well there where no other microbe uh, existed or at least other microbes were having a hard time. And so it managed to replicate and further mutations that, that allowed it to modify the unsaturated fatty acids would have been a selective advantage. So you can easily understand the, the evolutionary process uh, going on here. So that's high and, and low temperatures. Um, it's also worth mentioning saline and dry environments, again, just because these have relevance to the surface of Mars in particular, or briny, icy moons, if you're interested in those. And there are all sorts of environments on the Earth um, where there's lots of brine and salt. This is the Dead Sea. You can see these, uh, these salts here. Uh, and this is the, the Atacama Desert. Now, you might think, why have I got those in the same slide? Because the challenges of both of these environments are fairly similar, and that is a lack of liquid water. In this case, the liquid water is caused by uh, osmotic pressure extracting water from the cell, the osmotic gradient in the salt. In this case, the lack of liquid water is simply evaporation and dehydration. But the end result for the cell is the same. 
the interior of the cell lacks water. And so the adaptations to survive in these environments are, um, are diverse. Uh, one way that microbes can survive, for example, in high salt concentrations is simply to allow salt into the cell to, to, court, to, to, to create an equilibrium in the osmotic pressure. But of course, you'll imagine that if you take salt into a cell, you've got high iron concentrations, and that can damage molecules. So you need to have proteins that are adapted to high iron concentrations. If you don't like lots of ions in your cell, the other thing you can do is you can synthesize molecules that behave like ions osmotically, but are not actually ionic. And so you find that many microbes produce things like amino acids that produce a high solute concentration inside the cell, but not a high iron concentration. So amino acids are just kinder to the cell. And as a result, you can, you can, you can, you can equilibrate that osmotic differential, but you can do less damage than those ions would do inside the cell. Uh, another thing you can do is just go dormant. D don't adapt to it, just sit and wait until water comes back again, for example, in deserts. And so microbes form spores that allow them to survive in these extreme desiccated environments and wait until um, uh, water comes back again. This is just a nice example of, a, of an endolith. I'm going to come back to these in a moment when I, when I illustrate some research. These are cyanobacteria growing in a solid salt crust. Uh, this is from actually from Baja, California, not the Dead Sea, but the principle is the same. And you can see that they grow beneath the surface where there's some water and not near the surface. And for those of you interested in looking for biosignatures on Mars, ExoMars or other missions, immediately you can see the microbiological implications for life detection. These things are growing underneath the surface and not on the surface where they're protected underneath and where they can get access to liquid water where it may have desiccated on the surface. And in many extreme environments, we always find microbes tend to go under the surface to escape surface extremes uh, in order to find more clement environments, even just a few centimetres beneath the surface. So already you can start to see how the study of life in extreme environments uh, feeds into missions and the search for life uh, and where you might best look for life. In other words, if you want to look for life on another planet, you have to get ecologically real by going to environments on the Earth and exploring where the microbes uh, are. So these are the halophiles. These are microbes that uh, like to live in high sodium chloride salts and drought tolerant or xerophilic uh, microbes. And then uh, extremes of radiation. Um, so there are microbes that can tolerate radiation levels far higher than, than would kill a human being. Uh, the famous Deinococcus radiodurans um, that, that can survive about 10 uh, kilograms, which is about uh, 2,000 times higher than will kill a human being. And there are many other examples of microbes that can tolerate these high uh, radiation conditions like the uh, Crocochidiopsis here, which is a microbe that lives actually in salt crust like this. So this contains Crocochidiopsis. How do they do this? Um, there's a whole variety of ways in which microbes can tolerate high radiation. They can have multiple copies of their genome so that damage in one genome can be made up for by damage uh, by, by a non-damaged part of, of a second or third genome. They have highly effective DNA repair mechanisms. And they also have pigments like carotenoids that quench the reactive oxygen states uh, generated by high radiation. So you can see that Deinococcus radiodurans, uh, this actually isn't a great image because it's yellow in the background, but Deinococcus radiodurans has this orange-red pigmentation of carotenoids. So carotenoids, the same thing that make your carrots orange, uh, also make microbes orange. And these carotenoids can quench reactive oxygen states before those reactive oxygen states can interact with biological molecules to damage them. So this is all about uh, damage repair and, and uh, avoidance as well. So all of these sorts of adaptations and more besides can be used um, in an organism to tolerate these extremes. And it's worth pointing out that none of these things are mutually exclusive. Many organisms have multiple layers of, of tolerance to different extremes that they use depending upon how extreme the conditions um, become. So with all of these extremes, of course, the question we really want to ask as astrobiologists is what does that zoo, that shape of that zoo, look like? We can go out and gather all this information and microbiologists, like a sort of group of Guinness Book of Records fans, go out and they look at all these extremes and try and define the limits. And the truth is we actually don't know. This was a diagram that was drawn by Julian Wimpenny, who was a, a microbiologist at Cardiff University about 20 years ago, where he plotted 
pH, temperature and salinity for some known extremophiles and came up with this intriguing um, three-dimensional plot of the biosphere and that, that zoo surrounded by extremes that I mentioned earlier. Um, about two or three years ago, one of my postdocs, Jesse Harrison, um, did some work where we went out and tried to do this again using uh, defined strains in the laboratory. And we produced these interesting plots of temperature, pH, and salt concentrations. And you can do this with other extremes. And surprisingly, when you go and do this, there's a real lack of information in the literature on the tolerance, the known tolerance of organisms. People go to extreme environments and they look at microbes in the natural environment. But when it actually comes to defining the limits in the laboratory, there isn't much information at all. In fact, this was based, I forget now, on 87 strains, which was the, which was the highest number of strains where we could really find well-defined limits based on well-known microbial media in the literature. So it's a fairly tedious task, but if anyone wants something useful to do, uh, a really useful thing will be to look at more and more isolated microbes at different extremes, and particularly combined extremes, so that we can start to map this n-dimensional hyperspace of, uh, of, of the biosphere, the Earth's biosphere. Because only when we have this can we um, truly define the limits of life and then use that to look at the habitability of other planets. You can ask yourself, for example, where are the high temperature, high pH, low salt microbes? Or the microbes that can tolerate high salt, high temperature and high pH? Does that just reflect the fact we haven't gone to those environments and studied them enough? Or does it reflect something fundamentally physical, like a microbe can't get enough energy to deal with high pH, high temperature, and high salt all at once? So is this a genuine fundamental barrier to life up here, or is it just that we haven't gone to these environments? So you can use these sorts of plots to think about interesting science questions. There must be some limit. This is not limitless. It doesn't extend in these axes uh, indefinitely. But the question is, uh, where? is that limit and how far does it go? And surprisingly, the current time, we just don't know the answer to that. Yeah. This is uh, measuring growth of the bacteria. Yes, replication. Yes, exactly. So you can imagine that maybe there are other species that we don't know how to culture. Yes, exactly. Yeah, this is completely, completely unsatisfactory yeah. as a result. The reason why we did it, as I say, is because because the, the uh, the maximum growth conditions were well-defined under well-defined conditions. So you go into an environment and you extract DNA and you find microbes at some high temperature or high pH. Are they active? Are they just microbes that have washed in? You know, these are things that plague the literature. You're pretty sure there are things growing there because you see a community and you can extract, for example, uh, we don't have environments up here, 30% salt, 120 high pH, but there are environments closer to here that are currently empty in this diagram, for which we have real environments where people have extracted DNA. Um, but we don't know what the limits are of, of life in those, in those environments. So you're absolutely right. What's missing is a connection between environmental research and laboratory studies of these organisms. And I should also say that these are based on looking at each extreme individually. We know even less about combined extremes and what the limits to life are when you add extremes together. And very few natural environments have one extreme. Most natural environments are salty and hot or cold and high pressure. So the, the amount of literature on combinations of extremes is, is, is even less. So there's lots of work to do. Astrobiologists have a long way to go. So what I want to do now is just transition into talking about some science. That was a sort of general education part of it. And I want to uh, as I said earlier, because this is a school, I think it's useful just to, to illustrate some of the things that we've been doing in our lab so you can see w how we use this sort of thinking to do experiments and, and to ask questions about um, these extreme environments. And one question that is very interesting um, that I want to just talk about and show you some experiments that one of my PhD students did is are Martian aqueous environments habitable? So we now know, uh, and you will have seen this already, that that there is abundant evidence for, for liquid water in, in the history of, of, of uh, in the past history of Mars, particularly down here in the Noachian, but possibly even extending to the present day um, in, in terms of brine seeps and, and transient liquid water. 
And one of the things that we do know is that the, the geological trajectory of Mars was very, very different to the Earth. So on the Earth, most brines on the planet are dominated by sodium chloride, whether that's the Dead Sea or ocean seawater. Uh, that has not been the case on Mars. What happened on Mars is that the planet transitioned from the Noachian when there were these sort of freshwater environments that probably looked somewhat similar to environments that we see on early Earth or even on present day Earth. And then it transitioned into the Hesperian. And during that period, uh, the amount of water on Mars declined. Uh, the, the hydrological cycle became less vigorous. And, and so the amount of water around was a lot less. And the result of that was that the water tended to mix with sulfur dioxide from volcanoes and form sulfuric acid that then reacted with basaltic rocks to form sulfate salts. So you had this period of acid weathering. You can see this in Hawaii that's very dry. You get acid weathering around some of those volcanoes where you, can, uh, you get this acid etching of basalts. And the result is the formation of sulfate salts on Mars. And this has been seen in places like Meridiani Planum in particular, that, that is a particularly excellent example of Hesperian acid weathering, where you've got abundant production of sulfate salts that you can detect using MOSPAR spectrometry on the, on the Mars Exploration rovers, uh, for example. And so here's a big difference between brines on the Earth and brines on Mars, or liquids on Mars, that they have a much higher concentrations of sulfates. You can find sulfate ponds on the Earth. If you go up to the Basque Lakes, which is just northeast of Victoria, on an Indian reservation, you can find some small ponds up there that we've explored quite extensively, where you've got sulfide rocks in contact with fluids from this valley, and it forms these ponds that are saturated in magnesium sulfate. But they're very, very rare. And so the question is, could they be habitable? Um, so here's the question. Widespread salt minerals uh, indicate that there are hypersaline waters over geological time. And as I mentioned earlier, there may even be some evidence for brines on present day Mars. So this is controversial, still a controversial point of discussion. These, um, these brown streaks that you can see coming out from the edges of, of slopes and impact craters on Mars, uh, do they involve liquid water? That's a whole other lecture. Uh, but one hypothesis is it could represent briny fluids seasonally being produced uh, and seeping out from the edges of, of craters on Mars. Uh, obviously, Mars today, uh, at least the average atmospheric pressure, is, is pretty much on the triple point. So when this stuff comes out to the surface, it eventually will boil away or, or dry away, which is why we, we don't have sustained liquid water on the surface of Mars, because it's, it's at, at or, or only partially above the triple point by a few millibars at most. But there may be brines on the surface of present day Mars, but certainly in the past, there was more liquid water in the Hesperian, probably a lot of sulfate containing salt. So as microbiologists, we, we look at that sulfate, uh, those ideas about sulfate salts, and we think, are they habitable? And what would limit life in these, in these, in these briny environments? Well, we know that brines on the Earth are inhabited by microbes. So this is the Dead Sea and you can see it's gone nice and red and that's because it's full of archaea that produce these carotenoids that I mentioned earlier, these pigments. Uh, so you can see macroscopic evidence of life on Earth in briny fluids and they are very happy growing in these uh, environments, these halophiles. Uh, but all of these brines, as I mentioned earlier, are dominated by sodium and chloride ions, which are monovalent ions, right? Na plus Cl minus. This becomes important in a second when I explain uh, the results that, that Mark Fox Powell find. So just to reiterate, on Mars, the acidic weathering of basaltic rocks results in very different geochemistries, brines dominated by magnesium <laughs> and iron sulfates. And there are no, no, there are no, no natural analogues that are exactly like the models for brines on Mars. There are sulfate containing um, lakes, but there's no exact analog. So how do you, how do you uh, address the question of these, whether these are habitable? And this is where the microbiologists can start doing their work. What we can do is we can go into the lab and we can make Martian brines based on geochemical modeling. So the modelers will look at the rocks in, in Meridiani Planum and they will make predictions on the geochemical composition of those brines and we can recreate them in the laboratory. So what Mark did is created brines um, of different evaporative stages. So stage A is where it's a very dilute brine. 
and stage B is where the brine has evaporated and you've got a much more concentrated brain, brine. So we took these two N-member brines, uh, uh, dilute brines and, and highly concentrated brines, and we grew microbes in them. And the only extreme that these microbes were uh, exposed to was the brine. So we gave them plenty of food, moderate temperatures, and we grew them in different aerobic and anaerobic conditions. On Mars, of course, they would be cold and they wouldn't have as much organics. So what we're asking here is, assuming everything else is good for the microbes, how does geochemistry alone limit life? So this is a way to reduce the number of variables and simply ask the question, how does this weird geochemistry on Mars influence the ability of life to grow? So then we go out and we collect lots of inocula from Iceland and from soils and from salty environments on the Earth, and we add them to these brines, and we see whether anything will grow uh, in, these, in, these, um, in these brines. And then we set up various controls to look at uh, low water activity, pH, and combined extremes to try and understand whether microbes could grow where you've got these mixtures of uh, physical extremes. This is the most useless slide in my talk. Can't see it. Just to show you that people model these things. Uh, these are the different brines that were studied by Nick Tosca uh, based on uh, geochemical modeling of what we think uh, water rock interactions were like on Mars. Uh, so these are the closest estimates we have to Martian geochemistry. And then you let these things grow. And as microbiologists, we do standard things like we stain the microbes to see whether there's anything growing. We measure growth rates to look at the, the rate of growth of the microbes. And then the other thing we do is to, um, is to uh, extract the DNA and see what sort of communities have grown um, in, these, in these brines. And you can extract the DNA and you get these, um, these plots of the different microbes growing in these different brines. And what you'll see, so there's a lot of information in here, so don't worry about all the details. I just want to focus in on the main points. And the main point is this, that the Martian brines uh, sustain a unique community of microbes that's very different from sodium chloride rich brines on the earth. So here is the inocula growing in sodium chloride rich brines which are analogous to terrestrial brines and you can see they've gone this nice red color. These are the archaea here that are growing as they would on, on the earth. And In the Martian brines we end up with a completely different community growing in there. And this is quite fun. Okay, This is where the fun part of astrobiology is because these brines do not exist on the Earth. So we've actually got a community of microbes uh, growing in a simulated Martian brine for which there is no natural Earth analog. I'm not saying there's life on Mars. I have no idea what the scientific significance of this particular community structure is. But it's quite fun that you can create these alien geochemistries that you think exist on other planets. And you can actually look at the microbial communities growing in them uh, and create these totally unusual ecologies uh, that are not found anywhere on the Earth. So we can systematically look through all of our brines and we can ask, what is the limit of life in these Martian brines. Okay, now this is where it gets a bit complicated, so hold on here and I'll try and explain this. Uh, but the end point is, is, is relatively simple. Here is a plot of pH on the x-axis and on the y, AW, which is water activity. Now water activity is a measure of the availability of water. So pure water, distilled water, has a water activity of 1 and completely no water desiccated would be a water activity of zero. And depending upon uh, the water activity, life will either grow or it, or, or it won't. Most biology requires a water activity of about 0.9, but you can get microbes that grow at a water activity down at about 0.6. So there's a hard water activity limit to life, below which there's not enough water for microbes to reproduce. So if we plot pH, versus water activity. We can draw this nice red line that suggests that nothing below here should grow. And then what we can do is plot environments on the Earth in our diagram here. So the green squares here are natural environments on the Earth that you can go out and measure. And these red squares are where nothing is growing. And these are all natural environments on the Earth. So you can see that if you go out onto the Earth and you look at microbes in different environments, they plot nicely on this diagram. And there's this nice line here below which you don't find anything growing and above which you can find natural environments with life. And that is consistent with what we observe in the laboratory using microbial isolates.
Now these circles here are Mark's brines and the line here denotes going from that dilute brine to the evaporated brine. Okay, so this is the evaporative sequence of our Martian brines. And what you'll see is that he's got these green brines, which means that things grew in them. But up here, interestingly, there are Martian brines, and there's one here, that will not grow any microbes in them from any inoculum. And yet, they seem to be above the water activity limit for life. So they seem to be uninhabitable, and yet, in a region that should be permissive for microbial growth. So why is this the case? So we scratched our heads for a long time, think, trying to figure out why these Martian brines were uninhabitable, and yet they overlap with environments on the Earth and also some brines that we know can sustain life. And this is where the history of Martian geology comes in, because what you can do is plot this slightly differently. And, and here is a different plot where I've got water activity on the y-axis and on the x-axis, ionic strength. Now, ionic strength is a measure of the charge density in the solution. Okay. Now, if you remember, we said that brines on the Earth tend to be made of monovalent ions like Na plus and Cl minus. But Martian brines have all these multivalent ions like Mg2 plus, Fe2 plus, SO4 2 minus. And that, those, uh, th those, those multi and divalent ions create a high ionic strength. And we know that high ionic strength is bad for life. So Mg2 plus is a bad ion for DNA. For anything with a high charge density, it tends to disrupt biological molecules. So if you calculate the ionic strength and plot it against water activity, you find that all the uninhabitable Martian brines plot to the right in this high ionic strength region and all the habitable brines on the left. And intriguingly, one of these brine combinations actually transitions from habitable to uninhabitable when you evaporate it and it becomes high ionic strength. So our working hypothesis here is that on Mars, because of this divergent geological history, you ended up with a lot of brines that had these multivalent and divalent ions. And so unlike on the Earth, where water activity limits life, on Mars, ionic strength is also a limit to life because of these multivalent ions. So going right back to our, our zoo of life, surrounded by physical extremes, up until now, we tend to think of life as limited by water activity. Here is a limit to life that is not found in any natural environment on the Earth, but may be relevant to Mars because of these multivalent and divalent ions. So it's an illustration of how looking at life in extremes can inform our ability to assess the habitability of other planets. But also, if we go to other planets, we may even find um, extremes that we don't recognize on the Earth. And the other thing I should say, which is a justification for astrobiology, is often going to other planets can improve your understanding of life on the Earth. So if I was to say, why would you go and explore Mars? I would say that by going to Mars, we can learn about the limits to life that might improve our understanding of life on Earth. In this case, we've always assumed that life in high, in briny environments on the Earth is simply limited by water activity, and that defines the limit of life in salty environments on the Earth. But it seems like water activity is a particular condition on the Earth. So just to summarize this bit of research, um, on the left-hand side here, you can see that, that Mars and Earth have taken very different trajectories, largely because of their different size. Mars uh, lost its magnetic field. The water uh, froze or, or was sputtered out into space. Earth maintained large bodies of liquid water. Those large bodies of liquid water circulating through the crust generate brines that are predominantly uh, monovalent. And as a result, the limit to life is set by water activity, whereas on Mars, uh, many of the brines may be dominated by sulfates and, and multivalent ions. So one of the limits to life is ionic strength. And that's uh, a limit to habitability defined by the different geological histories of two planets. Now, of course, I should say it's a slightly simplified. You can find some sulfite, sulfate brines on the Earth, and you can also find chlorides on the Earth. In fact, we know on Mars, rather, we know there's halite on Mars. So I'm, I'm simplifying somewhat uh, because these conditions exist on both planets. But, but on Mars, we've got a, a greater prevalence of these ions, and on Earth, a greater prevalence of these ions. So this is an example of how, um, looking at microbes in the laboratory, you can get planetary scale uh, insights into, um, into uh, life elsewhere.
So I've, I've spoken a little bit about lab work. Um, many of us as microbiologists and astrobiologists, I guess part of the fun part of being an astrobiologist is also doing field work and going to some of these extreme environments and studying life there. And for a while, I've had a sort of slightly morbid interest in asteroid craters. I'm not sure where, actually, I do know where that started. It started actually with the project I'm about to talk about. But these are interesting events. They're obviously not very good for dinosaurs, and they wouldn't be very good for human beings either. But they're a geological uh, fact of life. And although we don't see them, um, thankfully, regularly over geological time, uh, they, they have been quite common, at least in, in the uh, scope of of Earth's history. And the question is, um, what happens to biology in, in craters? And I will explain the relevance of this to say the search for life on Mars a bit later. Um, so what I want to do here is just illustrate something uh, counterintuitive, a, a finding that we came across. Now, this is old data. It's about 16 years ago, this project. So uh, reminiscing here. But something that was unexpected that we found in craters it illustrates how the study of life in extreme environments can tell you some interesting things, uh, but can also inform the search for life uh, possibly elsewhere. So, so this was a project I got involved with in, in, my, uh, in my early youth when I was a postdoc at NASA Ames. And it was a project set up by Pascal Lee at NASA Ames to study this crater here called the Horton Impact Crater that's up here on Devon Island, which happens to be the largest uninhabited island in the world. And you fly up to Edmonton here, and then you fly up to Resolute, which is the nearest, um, the nearest town to Horton Crater. And then you fly into Devon Island, and this is the crater from space. X marks the spot. This was the base camp for the Horton Mars project, which incidentally is still operating. If anyone wants to go to this crater, you can get in contact with Pascal Lee at the SETI Institute, and you can find your way up there. Um, it's been operating now for about uh, 18 years. As a microbiologist, I'm interested in this place. I was interested in it. One, because it's a crater, and there hadn't been any microbiology work done in craters. And I was intrigued to see uh, what microbes can you find in craters, and how can you link microbiology to the geology of an impact crater? And is there anything to be learned in these environments? And also because it's a polar desert. And when you're a microbiologist, you don't like pesky plants in your field sites. Uh, polar deserts are good places to look at microbes and their interactions with geological substrates without the complicating effects of of plants and multicellular animals. So this is, uh, this is the polar desert. This is the base camp. These are our tents up here. And we, we fly up here, uh, we flew up here rather, for, for about two months uh, to work in this environment. When I say there are, there's, there's no multicellular animals to get in the way, uh, there are polar bears. You have to be quite careful when you go out into the field. You go out on these ATVs, and you have to take shotguns with you and keep an eye out for polar bears, which is an interesting experience. In fact, one year we were up there. We found polar bear tracks about a kilometer out, uh, just going round and round the base camp. And so there was evidently a polar bear waiting for some hapless scientist to walk out to get their lunch. <laughs> uh, when the scientists walked out, they tend to come off the sea ice um, uh, at, at the beginning of spring, and then the sea ice retreats, and they get stuck on Devon Island, and then they wander around getting hungry. So a, a base camp of scientists is a good target. So that's an interesting aspect of, of field work. Uh, up, in, up in the high Arctic. Uh, as you fly in, it's a really spectacular view. This is, this is Horton Crater here. And you can see these gray rocks. And, and as you walk along them, this is just an image on the ground, you can see it's almost got this lunar-like appearance. And this material is called breccia or, or suavite, uh, depending upon the geologist you talk to. Uh, they classify these things differently. But in essence, it's, it's melted rock that was generated during the impact that occurred uh, 39 million years ago. So if you had been uh, standing here 39 million years ago, which obviously wouldn't have been a good thing, you would have seen probably something on the order of a kilometer, slightly higher, maybe two kilometer diameter rock hurtle in from space at about 11 kilometers a second. It slammed into what is now the Canadian high Arctic. And uh, it would have thrown material up into the sky and then melted this material that fell back into the crater. And you literally would have seen a, a molten rock bath full of molten rock with broken up bits of rock. And you can actually see some of this breccia here. I probably should have just brought a lump with me. But you can see an image here. And it almost looks like concrete. You can see this gray matrix with bits of crushed up rock inside there. And this is testament to the, to the violence of this impact event when this 
uh, breccia lens was formed. This is the Horton River today that cuts through it. But in fact, this breccia lens is one of the best preserved breccia lens of any uh, impact crater uh, on the Earth. We know that the environment was very different just out of interest 39 million years ago. Uh, if you wander into, um, into the Horton crater, you go up here, you can actually find um, uh, late Miocene lake sediments in, in the crater that directly overlay the breccia. So we think that at the time of the impact, the high Arctic was actually covered in pine forests and grass. Uh, there were woolly rhinoceros. Uh, and intriguingly, there's a layer in this uh, lake sediments that have been studied by um, uh, ecologists. It's called the bunny layer. And it's just a layer of dead rabbits <laughs> one year, uh, a few uh, thousand years after the impact. So they obviously got some disease like myxomatosis and they all died and got washed into the lake. There's this layer of giant bunnies that were about this big so that, that ran across the Miocene forest. So it's an interesting environment. It would have been covered in life uh, and pine forests. The, 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 the impactor came in, it probably would have uh, uh, extirpated life, destroyed life for uh, many tens of kilometers around the impact site. And the blast wave probably would have flattened forests for hundreds of kilometers. This would have been not a global scale uh, extinction event, but it would have been locally uh, catastrophic. And, and today the impact crater is in the polar desert. Now, what you can do is walk around on these, uh, on these hills and, and look at the rocks. Uh, that are sitting on these on these breccia hills. And if you do that, you'll find um, these rocks uh, made of gneiss, G-N-E-I-S-S. -S. So this is a uh, metamorphic rock. This is a one kilometer scale bar. And you can see this, um, this layer of green just beneath the surface of the gneiss, these microbes growing um, just, just within this rock. And these are called crypto endoliths, okay, crypto because you can't see them, endo because they're inside, lithos rock, so uh, microbes living inside rocks that are cryptic because you have to break the rock open to actually see the microbes just beneath the surface. And you'll see that they're, uh, they can't go too deep because they're photosynthetic. If they go too deep, they can't get enough light to grow, so they're restricted in the depth they can go. And no, they don't do very well on the surface because they're exposed to uh, cold, desiccating polar winds. So they tend to grow just beneath the surface in this thin layer uh, where they can get just sufficient light to grow. Now, it won't surprise you to know that geomicrobiologists sit around in coffee breaks arguing about what to name microbes in rocks. So while we're on this topic, uh, given this is an astrobiology school, here's some education on what to name microbes that live on and in rocks. So what I've just spoken about are cryptoendoliths, these things. These are microbes that get into the rock, and if there's sufficient porosity, they grow inside the rock and form these um, communities in the interstitial spaces in the microbes. If it's a microbe that's just growing on the surface of a rock, that might be uh, you know, the green slime you see on, on an old building, that's an epilith. If it's a microbe growing in a crack in a rock that's connected with the surface, that's a chasmoendolith. Okay? If it's a microbe that bores its way actively into a rock, like by dissolving the rock, that's a uendolith, a true endolith. And if it grows under the rock at the soil rock interface, that's called a hyperlith. OK, so these are the different types of microbes that grow in and on rocks. So what I mean talking about here are cryptoendoliths that are quite common in. Uh, but what about the ones which, for example, grow in lava caves? So they're kind of in the surface, but they don't have light. Yeah, yeah. OK, so this, is <laughs> so this is why it ends up as a, as a coffee table discussion. So what do you call a microbe that's in a cavity that's as big as a cave but growing on the surface? Is it an epilith growing in a cave or is it a chasmoendolith? Or is a cave too big to be a chasmoendolith? And then at what point does a fracture in a rock transition from being a fracture where something's a chasmoendolith to being a cave? So what's the difference between a, a fracture and a, and a cave? And then you can have discussions with geologists about when a chasmoendolith becomes an epilith in a cave or whether it's a chasmoendolith. And all microbes tend to dissolve rocks in some way. So does that mean that all, all microbes growing in rocks are really uendoliths because they're all doing some sort of disruption? And all of these interstitial spaces that the cryptoendoliths are to some extent connected with the surface. Otherwise, how did the microbe get in there in the first place? So when does interstitial space become a chasmoendolith or a true cryptoendolith? So you can end up with endless 
pointless hours of discussion uh, about what to call microbes in rocks. But generally speaking, it's, it's sort of useful because you can, you can broadly classify something that you can't see from the surface inside as a cryptoendolith, something that's in a, a fracture you can see as a chasmoendolith, something on the surface and so on. So, so they're useful ways of just differentiating between different microbes. But you raise a good point. You know, it's a, a typical point in science is how, how do you classify these things? It's a sort of question of uh, nomenclature. So, so this is what I'm talking about, these, these cryptoendoliths that are growing just beneath the surface. But the question is, what, why are these interesting in an impact crater? And, and what was the significance of these? Uh, what was interesting about them is that the, the rocks in which they're growing have been subjected to asteroid impact 39 million years ago. This is a lump of gneiss that you can find outside Horton Crater. So if you go to the far edges of, of Devon Island, you can find this gneiss. There's nothing particularly interesting about this. It's, um, it's quite dense. Uh, you can see this sort of layered structure. And then 39 million years ago, when it was subjected to impact, it was heated to about 1,200 degrees or thereabouts and, and shocked to uh, a couple of tens of gigapascals. And the effect of that impact shock was to melt the rock and create this glass-like texture. It almost looks like pumice. And you can see this porosity inside this rock. In fact, the density of the rock, um, the shock rock, is, is reduced by more than half. The pore surface area, that's the pore space available for the microbes, is increased by about 25 times. And the light transmission is increased by about 10 times. So, so the effect of the impact has been to create a habitat for life that was not there before. And why is that interesting? Well, it's interesting from a general point of view, because generally we tend to regard impact events as destructive to life. And you're obviously aware that an impact is associated with the end Cretaceous extinction and the destruction of, of the dinosaurs. And in fact, about 75% of life at the end Cretaceous. So we, we generally, as human beings, for good reason, associate impact events with being bad for life. But here's an example of the way impact has actually improved conditions for microbiology by transforming material that is otherwise difficult for microbes to colonize into something that's better for microbes to colonize. So this is the counterintuitive observation that what's true for macroscopic life is not always true for microbes. It's only by going into field sites and looking at these materials that you could make that prediction. I mean, you could predict it. You could think to yourself, asteroid impacts fracture material Therefore, that might make it better for biology. So a priori, you could probably make that prediction. But, but it's really going into the field and looking at these things and making these observations uh, by, which you, by which you discover these things. Th this is uh, an SEM image of, um, of these rocks. I think that's a 200 micron scale bar there and a 20 micron scale bar. But you can see this almost Swiss cheese-like texture to this impact shocked rock that's been turned glassy, so it's, it's been shocked. And you can see a microbial biofilm uh, growing in the rock. This is a better image. And you can see the microbes inside uh, this cavity in the rock forming this biofilm inside the rock. So here's an example of, of these cavities being created uh, in, inside, the, in, inside the impact shock material. These cryptoendoliths are found in other places in the world. Um, they're not only found in the Arctic. For example, you can find them in Antarctica. This is, uh, these are from the dry valleys of Antarctica, uh, down near McMurdo, down here. And if you go to the dry valleys, you can find these sandstones. And if you break them open, you will also find cryptoendoliths growing in rocks. So this is a one centimeter scale bar. This is a layer of lichen. This is a layer of cyanobacteria. But all of these cryptoendoliths are found in sandstones that are naturally high porosity rocks. So in general, before, in fact, before we found the cryptoendoliths up in the uh, Horton Crater, cryptoendoliths had only been described in these very porous sandstone materials where the microbes can get into the rock and, and grow sideways uh, into, into these sandstones and form these colonies. But impact shock can, can create these, um, uh, these habitats within rock. We would expect this to be fairly common actually in impact craters. Um, these are just some geophysical data showing uh, different ways in which you can try and estimate the, the effects of shock on, uh, on impact crater materials. Here is, for example, calculated Charlevoix, which is uh, one impact crater. This is zero, which is the center of the crater, and then the, uh, the, the, the distance out as a fraction of the uh, total crater radius. 
and you can see the density of fracturing Al Jajitshin, which is a crater uh, in, in Siberia, Yanis uh, Yavi, which is in Finland. This is porosity directly measured in uh, impact shot rocks. And this is electrical conductivity in the Cillian uh, impact structure uh, in Sweden. And this is a measure of uh, briny fluid in, in, in the rocks. So the measure of conductivity is in some sense a measure of uh, the, the fractures and the movement of fluid through the crater. Uh, and all of these things show the same effect, which is unsurprising, which is as you go towards the centre of the crater, you increase porosity and fracturing. So on a wider scale, you might predict that in fact the centre of craters, although the most uh, hostile regions initially at the point of impact because of the energy and the pressure, would eventually turn into places that are good for microbiology. That tells us something about life on Earth and about the habitats that, that life can persist in on the Earth. But it may also inform the, the search for life elsewhere. And this is coming back again to the way in which micro, microbiologists can <coughs> inform um, missions, search for life elsewhere. So for example, if I was going to go to Mars, I mean, there are lots of places I would look at, uh, ancient lake beds, ancient rivers. In fact, Mars now seems to be covered in, in good places to look for past life or, or present day life. But one um, promising place may be craters, because unlike on the Earth, uh, most of the craters on Mars have not been destroyed because of the lack of plate tectonics and subduction. So uh, unlike on the Earth, you have a vast number of craters, in fact, estimated to be about 40,000 craters with diameters greater than five kilometers on Mars. There's a lot of craters and they have been fractured and they have probably created improved conditions for fluid flow. And as a microbiologist, I would probably um, go and look in craters as a good place to test the hypothesis of past life. Uh, of course, these are difficult places for rovers to get into, but for a, for a human mission, for example, this is Victoria Crater, an image taken by Opportunity Rover, and you can see all those nice fractures in that crater. And if there was ever groundwater flow in this crater, in analogy to Horton, I would have thought looking in those fractures, if there was a hydrothermal system established in this crater, uh, these sorts of places would be good places uh, to look for life. And then if you found no life there, um, that wouldn't prove no life on Mars, but it might tell you that even in a very promising impact environment, uh, the conditions were not suitable for biology or biology did not colonize that environment. And that might be an important finding. So again, this is not the only place to look for life, right? You've got rivers on Mars, you've got uh, briny environments, you've got ancient lakes. Um, but it's an illustration of how by going into the field and looking at extreme life in extreme environments, you get ideas that can better inform the search for life elsewhere and can constrain the sorts of places where you look for biology. So this is sort of ecology meets extreme environments meets mission uh, planning. So for any of you who are biologists, this is the way in which you can contribute to, to mission um, mission discussions. So that's field work, an example of field work. And finally, I just want to give an example of how we have tried to use astrobiology um, to advance the human exploration of space as well, something I, I in particular have a great enthusiasm for, uh, not just technically and scientifically, but as a sort of long-term vision of humanity. I think that exploring space is a sound thing to do to, um, to build a multi-planet species, but also to get access to resources beyond the Earth. So something my research tries to do, we often don't get funding for it, but where and when we can, we try and get involved in research that links us with, with human exploration and doing microbiology for benefits of human exploration. And here's an example of, it's an example of research, but it's also an example of how in your research career, you can end up doing things that you didn't expect to be doing at the time. So wind the clock back about 10 years ago, and I'm down in a fishing village in the south of England called Beer, looking at microbes in cliffs uh, because we'd got some funding to look at coastal erosion from people that worry about their houses falling off cliffs. And they want to know, do the microbes eat the cliffs and accelerate the early processes of coastal erosion? So we're down there looking at these cliffs and examining the microbes that live in these cliffs. And these cliffs are quite extreme environments. I mean, they're dry, apart from when water gets washed in by the sea, but generally they get quite desiccated. There's not much food in there. There's some organic material that leaches down from these plants, but generally they're quite nutrient poor. And the microbes that live on the surface of these cliffs get exposed to solar radiation. So you would expect extremophiles to be living in here. 
So we're collecting these rocks, and then about a week later, I got a call from uh, Gerda Hornick, who, who, who you may know, uh, astrobiologist, DLR. She says, we've got some space on an ISS mission to put some samples on the outside of the space station um, to, to study survival of microbes in extreme conditions. Do you want to send some? And we need them quite quickly. So all I had to hand was some some rocks from Devon. So I, of course, said, yes, yes, we have samples immediately ready. So we collected some samples. Uh, this is Beer, fishing village in South of England. If you're ever in um, holiday in, in the UK, uh, I recommend Beer. It's a great place to go on the south coast there. Here are the microbes living on the surface of the cliffs. So these are the, uh, the um, algae and cyanobacteria that live there. So we collected our rocks, and this is a, about a centimetre across. This is a piece of uh, Devon rock stuck to a piece of glass. And when we put our samples in the exposed facility, so this is the, uh, the ESA facility, it's a sort of, um, well, I, I was going to say glorified box. If, 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 uh, uh, if ESA heard me say that, they would kill me. This took a long time to develop, and it wasn't developed by me, it was developed by DLR. It's actually a very <laughs> sophisticated piece of equipment with with lids here that open up when it's on the outside of ISS. But in a sense, it's just a box with our samples in there. And then it was launched uh, to space in, in Atlantis. Here, here are our samples being launched to space. And we did a very simple experiment, which is to bolt them on the outside of ISS and ask the question, did anything survive? So these were bolted onto the outside of the Columbus module, and they stayed there for about a year and a half, exposed to the ultraviolet radiation above the Earth's atmosphere, extreme desiccation, and ionizing uh, radiation. So here's the experimental setup, Devon, pieces of Devon on the space station. Leave them there for a year, and then we brought them back on uh, Space Shuttle Discovery. Uh, just as an aside, as an amusing story, they got stuck in, in the post office. It took me about a, a week to get them out of the UK post office. They got from Earth orbit to Earth quicker than they got out of the British postal system. But anyway, we eventually got our samples. And what did we see? Well, on the left-hand side here, you can see the microbes before they went into space. This is the biofilm on the rock, just some uh, cells on the surface. This is an SEM image, and you can just see the morphology of the cells. Uh, you can't see very clearly. It's a bit bright. But anyway, you can, you, if it's dark, you can see these cells forming this biofilm. The morphology is preserved, as you can see here. But what you can see is on the surface of these cells, they've essentially been sort of caramelized. It's like a um, microbial creme brulee in space. And what has happened here is that the sugars have, have been cross-linked. It's actually Maillard reactions. It's the same thing as creme brulee. It's where the sugars have, have cross-linked and formed this sort of uh, caramelized layer of sugars in the extracellular polysaccharide. Did anything survive? Well, only one microbe survived, and, and here it is, the, the space survivor, and it's a glare capsa. Uh, you can see um, this is a half centimeter scale bar. It forms these uh, very um, uh, unimpressive looking, but impressive to a microbiologist, uh, colonies on the surface of a plate. You can see here, this is a transmission electron micrograph cutting through one of the cells. And then here you can see the, one of the keys to its survival in space, which is um, these, these cell uh, clusters. So it forms these, these colonies of cells um, that form these, these sort of biofilms. And on the top left-hand side here, this is a phylogenetic tree, and this is our microbe. And you'll see that it's related to Crocochidiopsis, which I mentioned earlier in the talk, which is those microbes that live in rocks. In fact, its closest living relative is a Crocochidiopsis that lives in Antarctic rocks. Uh, so these things are drifting around in the atmosphere. Presumably this thing landed on a cliff in Devon. It thought this is a bit nicer than Antarctica. I'll take up residence here and carry it on growing. Um, so it's a, a rock dwelling microbe. How does it survive in space? One reason is these biofilms. So the cells on the outside um, are killed by ultraviolet radiation. But in so doing, they protect the interior of the colony from UV radiation. So there's a, a biofilm protecting effect. But we also find that these microbes are very radiation resistant. Um, so I mentioned radiation resistance earlier on in the talk. These microbes will tolerate about eight or nine kilograms, which is uh, just slightly less than 2,000 times higher than the maximum tolerance for a human being. So they've got intrinsic ionizing radiation resistance, and they form these colonial uh, growth um, habits. So here's an example, again, of how by doing experiments you can learn things about the survival of 
life in extreme environments and how things will, will survive in these conditions. But to go one step further, you might say, well, why did you do that? Well, one, just out of fundamental scientific interest, but you might think beyond that to um, human exploration of space. Can we use microbes that can survive in extreme conditions to further human space exploration and settlement? So one of the things that, that ESA has gone a long way with developing, I think further than any other space agency, is developing a fully closed loop life support, support system. So this is the schematic of the Melissa life support system. Uh, the simple idea here is to, is to break down uh, crew waste and, and recycle it back through plants to produce um, uh, oxygen and, and food and, and crops in a bioregenerative life support system. Uh, you might eventually want to grow things on the surface of Mars in support of early settlement. Now, of course, all of these things are going to be in containers and they're not going to be exposed to the space environment. But surely if you build a life support system for the moon or Mars, it would be really good to build it with microbes and organisms that are robust to space conditions. If you land it on the surface of the moon, for example, and it breaks down or depressurizes, you don't want all of your microbes dying because then you've got to ship it all back from the Earth. Uh, if you have humans there, you may be in for some trouble. So if you can engineer your life support systems to have microbes that are robust to space conditions, you can create some more redundancy in the system and create a more robust uh, life support system. So you could imagine, for example, um, the synthetic biologists mining genes from microbes that you've selected using the space environment by exposing microbial communities to space, taking those microbes, extracting the genes, and then putting them in other microbes or plants, and creating space-resistant forms of microbes and plants that could be used ultimately for the, for the settlement of other planets. So part of the interest in looking at life in extreme conditions in space is to think about ways in which you might improve biology uh, for, for the long term exploration of space. And that could be oxygen production, uh, fixing nitrogen, uh, doing things like regolith amelioration where you add microbes to lunar rocks or lunar soil to break down that material and turn it into a soil, for example, uh, for growing crops. Uh, and so again, this is just an example of, um, in the context of this, uh, of this school, an example of the way in which, as a microbiologist, you can also connect your work into human exploration and settlement through ESA's uh, various programs like Melissa. And I should say that the Melissa group are always looking for, for new collaborators. It's a very open group, so you can you can walk into these sorts of things and just form collaborations and try and get support from your national space agencies to, to make contributions to, um, uh, to, to biology or, or microbiology um, in space. So in conclusion, uh, just some very brief, simple conclusions. Um, we've learned that life can inhabit a remarkable range of extreme environments, but I simply reiterate the fact that Although it is remarkable the number of environments, the biosphere is still a very limited thing in terms of its spatial extent. Um, extreme conditions individually in combination on the Earth may not be the same elsewhere. So even if the limits to life, if, even if we were to think those limits to life are universal, the types of limits that we find in other planets may not be the same. And this is where extremophile microbiologists come in because we can do experiments in the lab to try and understand the habitability, what limits habitability elsewhere, that the Martian brines are just one example. We can use microbiology as a tool to define the limits of known life. I put that word in very carefully because one criticism is always you're looking at terrestrial life, but as I say, one, we can't do anything about that, and two, it may not actually matter in the end. And then finally, we can use microbiology to investigate the capacities that life has to adapt to extreme conditions. And we can use field investigations to, to guide the search for life elsewhere. And then finally, as I mentioned at the end, to, um, to try and support the human exploration and settlement of space as well. So I'll end there. And I think uh, actually we're doing pretty well on time, maybe sort of 10 minutes for questions if anyone has any questions. Thank you.